Auditioning is its own beast. There are all these rules that they give you. Be gregarious, but don't try to be their best friend or else they're weird, weirded out. Be the kind of person that you would want to be around on set for 12 hours, but not needy. Come in with a story. I remember I would, at one point, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna tell you whatever the hell happened to me that day. So when people are like, so how are you doing? Great. I just got cut off on my way over here, almost ran into a parked car, what? And it starts this whole story and it's disarming to them, but it also allows for you to just shake off the fact that you're in there asking for something and go into it with the mindset that you're there to give something. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Simone Missick is an actor. She sat down with me in New York City to talk about the work. Do you have a typical first step that you take after you land the role to begin your preparation process? I do. I probably, depending on how much time I have, I'll read the script every day until I start the process, sometimes two, three times a day. Um, just because turning it inside out in that way, reading it from different characters' perspective to see where they are all coming from and how they fit into the tapestry really helps for me to not only find different things out about my character and who I am, how they see me. I, I do a, I had an acting teacher that gave us what she called the blueprint. And so I do this with every single character for everything that I do on screen. And it starts out with turning off your cell phone, your TV, mm. and you read. And don't read with any agenda. You read it to see what colors, what sounds, what visuals, what comes over you, and you jot those down as they come. Mm -hmm. And then you read it again, and you read for your character. What do you say about yourself, and what do other people say about you? Mm -hmm. And the third step is then you identify what is the one statement that either you say or that someone else says about you that is the most telling thing about you as a person. And that for me is usually the jumping off point for any character, whether it's what you say about yourself or what someone else says about you, it, it so informs how you approach everything else from that you know first moment. And then I go through in the blueprint, you go through how you grew up, where you're from, what are your parents like, what was your education, what is the time, if it's a, a different period, what was the culture like during that time, uh, your political views, your religious views. And so you're writing, you, you do all, all of this, this. writing. Yeah. All of it, and so it, it ends up being a, a little journal for right. the character. Right. And then um, I'll then go and approach every scene and break down every scene and just ask myself, you know, different questions about what it is that I need, what's my relationship to this person, and this is all the homework that I try to do before I hit set, yeah. moment one, because, you know, you could meet someone and, and they could have a process that's like completely foreign from yours, and they could not want to engage in that way, or they could not know how to engage in that way to come up with, you know, where, where are we at? How do we get here? Do we know each other? Like, what, did, what have you decided about our relationship? And a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes you'll, uh, you'll meet people who are like, you know, I, didn't really, I haven't really thought about it. Mm. And so... This is the fellow actor you're talking about in the yeah, scene. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Um, because different people process, you know, yeah. the material differently, and I don't judge that at all. Uh, because we're all here to learn something from each other. And if you come in with like, even if myself, I come in and I'm like, well, I've decided that we knew each other three years ago. Yeah. And this other person is like, well, I don't think it's that. You know, who mm -hmm. I have to be open to mm -hmm. listen to their process as well. But um, yeah, then you go in into the scene and hopefully you have someone who has thought about these things beforehand and you all are able to kind of glean things. It's, for me, it's such a, a treasure hunt. Like I started out wanting to be an actor from watching television and film. But then uh, in high school, 
I fell in love, well, ever since I was a kid, I've been in love with literature. And in high school and in college, I fell in love with plays and with novels that just are character driven. And so being an, I was an English major in college and a theater minor. Mm. And so I was acting on one end of my life and then on the other, I'm breaking down huge bodies of work and like mm. looking at the themes and looking at the characters and the through lines and the, mm -hmm. all of those things that when I read a script, I'm, I'm thinking about all of those things. It's not just, okay, well, where are they from? And you know, but then sometimes a character, you'll find it, it'll start with what kind of shoes do they wear? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I find that for theater specifically, it starts with the feet for me. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. It's, theater is different than the way I would approach um, the starting, the jumping off point for say TV or film. Do you have a game plan when it comes to auditioning and has it changed? You know, auditioning is its own beast yeah. right I've heard, uh, more people have used that word to describe it than any other word <laughs> really it's a bitch yeah. is yeah. what it is <laughs> you know uh oh so as i grow and as i grow as an artist the game plan has changed right when i was a younger actor just starting out in la it was like please like me but don't read my desperation yeah. you know uh and then I got to a point where I was like, fuck it. You either like me or you like, you don't or you don't. Um, I always come in prepared. I never, I could probably count on two hands the number of times I've gone into an audition with the paper in my hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are plenty of people who say, oh, don't do that. You know, and, and in Los Angeles, which is where I went after I graduated uh, from Howard University, there are classes that teach you auditioning and different people have different approaches. Some people are like, don't ever go in without the paper. Then they'll think that you think that you're prepared mm -hmm. when you don't want them to think that mm -hmm. this is the, the final thing. Like they have mm -hmm. to know that you've got more to give. And it's like, well, what does the paper in my hand do that? Like if you're, if you're a good casting director or a good director, you can give me an adjustment and hopefully I can take that with the, or without the paper in my hand. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it's always to try to go in uh, off book in order to be able to play and not be distracted by, you know, the, the paper. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a shedding of trying to give somebody what they want. It's so hard because, again, I have always been a lover of TV and film. I think that sometimes I don't allow for my artist brain to take over because the practical side of me can go, oh, I can see what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Like I see what they want. Mm -hmm. This is described this way. This person might pop into my head. Like it might be an actual actor that I know that I go, this is the right person for this role, but you still have to go in and, mm -hmm. and do your job. And so I remember as a younger actor, I would go in and try to give them my best version of what I thought they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten older, I've recognized that, you know, what is for you is for you. Every role, you, you will never get everything that you go out for. So changing and shrinking and trying to fit yourself into a box of what you think that someone is looking for is doing not only yourself, but them a disservice. Yes. They might not know what they're looking for until you come into the room and give it to them. Yes. And, you know, my husband is, always the the angel on my shoulder reminding me of that because one of his first big breaks uh, my husband is Dorian Missick and one of his first big breaks was in a movie called Two Weeks Notice with Sandra Bullock and Hugh Grant and the role was originally written for a 50 year old overweight Italian guy hmm. and the casting director was like I think you need to see this kid hmm. he was like 25 26 at the time and he went in and gave them him. They changed the role. They were no longer looking for a 50 something year old overweight Italian guy. They were like, let's go with this really, you know, slim 20 something year old black kid from New York. And so had he gone in and thought like, oh God, they're never gonna, 
you know. Or tried to be whatever version of an Italian all the way down. Right, that he could be yeah. in that box, yeah. right. Yeah. And so, you know, I just try as much as possible to um, come in and to approach it from my own creative space and not get distracted by uh, the character descriptions. It's like the, the character descriptions oh, can yeah. jack you up. And oh, yeah. I understand, I write also, so I understand why writers put that in there. But sometimes it can be so disheartening for an actor. I mean, I know this isn't necessarily for auditioning, but it's just for even approaching a project. You could read a, a script and you go through and you're like, man, this is amazing. And you get to like page 35 and then they're like, Amy, African-American, 30s. And you're like, oh shit. So all the other cool people that I read before this right. were absolutely not black. Right. This is right. the, this is, well, they could not yeah. have been because you've now taken that moment to say, well, this person is. And so, you know, there are things that uh, can, can limit your creativity as an actor that you kind of have to, shake off when you come into the room. Um, I, you have to be unshakable sometimes because, you know, there, there are casting directors who aren't the best for actors. You, you and I were talking about directing for actors. or yeah. Acting for directors. Right, acting for yeah. directors. Yeah. There you go. And yeah. there are some casting directors that I think could yeah. take some of that yes. in because, um, you know, you get people who don't look up who don't engage, who mime the words to you as you're, as you're Whoa. reading them. And this is all last week. <laughs> this I is not like, kid the, you not. This, this is, is not, not the like of your history. This is literally this is last. last week. Monday, I had somebody who was miming the words back to me. Tuesday, I had someone who never looked up from the page. Uh, Wednesday, I had somebody who was really great. Like she engaged. She wanted to see it different ways. You could tell that there was a part of her that wasn't phoning it in. And so, right. you know, there, and I've, I've had directors, you, I mean, casting directors, you walk in and they immediately tell you who you are at the scene. It's like, well, would you rather me give you who I am in the scene yeah. first? And then if there's something you don't like about it, yeah. then you say, you know what? Think about the fact that this happened before this moment and that happened before that moment and maybe put a little bit of that in there. Oh, yeah. But the, I, you know, I don't, sometimes I wonder why <laughs> some people have taken on that career if yeah. they don't like actors. Exactly. So. Oh my God, yeah. And I, I floated this as an idea. I want to be the, a guy in a, in, an, in a casting session who is there just to hug the actors and walk in. <laughs> <laughs> be nice? Man, listen. We need that. We need I mean, it. I mean, unless the it's first thing is a hug. Unless it's something where the person is like, a, what is it where you don't like to be touched? Oh yeah. Unless yeah, that, yeah. it's that yeah. kind of a character, yeah. and then it's like, well, don't hug me. You can hug me afterwards. Yeah. But you know, there are, like I was saying in LA, there's so many classes on how to to be in a room. There are all these rules that they give you. Be gregarious, but don't try to be their best friend or else yeah. they're weird, weirded out. Right. Be the kind of person that you would want to be around on set for 12 hours, but not needy. Come right. in with a story. I remember I would, at one point, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to tell you whatever the hell happened to me that day. So when people are like, so how are you doing? Great. I just got cut off on my way over here, almost ran into a parked car, what? And it starts this whole story and it's disarming to them, but it also allows for you to just shake off the fact that you're in there asking for something mm -hmm. and go into it with the mindset that you're there to give something. I'm there to give you my take on this. If it, and if I'm looking at it like it's an adversarial position or you have power over me or not, it automatically just sets it up to be something that it shouldn't be. And so I, you know, sometimes I come in and people are like, how are you doing? I'm pretty damn cool, but I'm tired. So <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to answer this question, but I want to know from you, from the actor in you, mm -hmm. what is it like to be Part of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> <laughs> like, does this mean all your worries are over? <laughs> as a, as as a, you know, nope. Marvel. <laughs> but tell me, and tell, tell, tell me about landing that. Yeah, 
Um, I'm a spiritual person. My husband's also an actor. I said that he was auditioning at CBS Radford for a pilot, end of pilot season, last pilot on the table. Uh, and I decided I was reading this book called The Circle Maker, which is all about walking physical circles around your, your dreams, your prayers. If it's a house oh. you want, you walk around that block. If it's oh. a job you want, you walk around that building. And so I'm walking around CBS Rapper. It's hot as all hell. And right when he finishes, we're in the car and we're, you know, so how did it go? What was it like? What was it? Because it was a test, a studio test. And out walks this guy. And my husband's like, hey, that's Cheo. And so he's like, Cheo, what's going on? Cheo walks over. Hey, how you doing? I'm sitting in the passenger seat. My husband's sitting in the driver's seat. Cheo's on my side of the car. And they're talking over me. And Cheo's like, yeah, man, what are you doing over here? And my husband's like, oh, yeah, man, I'm just auditioning for this CBS pilot, blah, blah, blah. And Cheo says, uh, well, if that doesn't work out, man, I'm doing a show over Netflix. Would love to have you. Now, they've worked together before on Southland, but he and I, we might have met in passing at a party. I don't think he knows that I'm an actor. And he's not talking to me. He's mm -hmm. talking to my mm -hmm. husband. So I'm on my phone. I'm not even really paying attention yeah. to him. And so he's like, all right, yeah, man, good seeing you. He walks off, we drive off, we go home. Um, that was April. In August, or maybe at the end of July, my husband gets an audition. And so as a lot of auditions are going nowadays, it's a self-tape at home. And so we're in our living room in LA and I'm putting him on tape and he's like, yo, this is so dope. I don't even know what this is or what they're doing, but this sound, I mean, if, if the character is anything like how it's written, I can't, I would love to do this, right? And so he puts himself on tape and um, he puts himself on tape for a lot of things. So really in my mind, I'm not committing to memory what this exact project mm -hmm. is. And so he doesn't hear anything and another month goes by and then I get a call to put myself on tape for this project and it's like top secret and dummy sides and you have no idea who this character is and what it is, but he puts me on tape and I was just like, wow, this chick is like dope. Like I would love to do this. But at that time, you know, auditioning in LA can sometimes feel like pissing in the ocean. You know, you're just yeah. like, I don't know if anybody can see it, but I'm doing it. And so I um, put myself on tape, didn't think anything of it. And my manager called me up immediately and she had never done this before. She's like, oh my God, that was amazing. You looked amazing. That was awesome. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, great, thanks, <laughs> bye. And over the course of two weeks, I started to hear that it was for Netflix because I didn't know who it was for. Yeah. Then you started to hear that it was possibly this Marvel project. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, it might be this character named Misty Knight. No clue. Had never heard of her prior to this. And mm -hmm. these are the actresses that they want for this part that were all famous, mm -hmm. accomplished, amazing uh, actresses. I put that out of my head. Didn't think anything of it. And I get a call from my manager that's like, hey, they want to see you. They want you to come in. And she was super excited. And I was like, oh, Stephanie, honey, they've already got A, B, C, and D that they're looking right. at for this role. But it might be nice to go in and meet LaRae Mayfield because she's dope. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Right. I'm, I'm thinking of the next job. And that's right. the thing about auditioning that they say, book the room, don't book the job. Like right. go in and make a good impression, which is right. such a like a shitty way to tell you to go after your dreams. Like, yeah. don't really want it. Yeah. Just go in there and like try to be around your dream. And so yeah. anyway, I was like, well, it'll be nice to meet Lorraine. And so I... Um, but it might have been good that you had these low... Perhaps. Things. Absolutely. Let me tell you why. So I'm, I'm not at all putting, you know, a ton of energy into getting it. Just want to go in there and, and give a good impression and I was opening a play that weekend in LA and got, after the fifth performance, the worst cold ever. Mm -hmm. It's like the worst. And that was on Sunday and the audition was on Tuesday. And so I think the audition was at like nine something. It was something early. I was like, I'm losing my voice 
I don't think I'll be able to go in and even speak. Is there any way that we can push the audition back? And she's like, uh, yeah, let me call him and find out. She calls and they're like, yeah, we're not seeing a bunch of people. So we can only push it back like a half hour. And that was the first time I was like, wait, they're not seeing a bunch of people. Mm. What's that about? Okay. So I go in, I'm like loaded up on Dayquil and Echinacea and I go in the room and the same guy that had walked out of the apartment mm. building when I was walking around CBS Radford and talking to Dorian is sitting in the room, mm. Cheo. And Jeff Loeb and Charles Murray, who later on went on to be the EP of one of the EPs on the show, and Tom Lieber was another uh, Marvel guy. So they're in the room, and I'm high <laughs> as a kite mm -hmm. on cold medicine, and I, you know, just prayed for ten minutes where my nose didn't run. I went in, I did the first scene, and they were like, "Oh, Jeff goes, can you do it this way?" Sure, did it another way. All right. Let's do the second scene. Do the second scene. He goes, uh, can you try to do it this way? I'm like, okay, cool. Did the second time. And they're like, all right, you good? I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm like, okay, thanks, bye. I leave. And then maybe five days later, I got the call that I got the job. Oh. And they said that they knew that it was me from the moment I sent the tape in. They just wanted to make sure that I wasn't a weirdo mm. when I came into the room. And so, yes, to your point, perhaps... It was better that I was not uh, eager and excited and overly emotive because it, it worked. Um, although I do believe that what is for you is for you, but I definitely didn't get in my own way in this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I, you know, when, when I got the call from Jeff, it was like, your life is about to change. Um, be prepared for that. You can speak to no one about this. So I packed up my house, my husband, and we moved to Brooklyn in a week and a half. Oh. And I did not tell anyone. I told like my two closest friends there and my family, cause I knew that they were in the vault, but I didn't tell anybody that I was leaving. So people were like, are you, are you shooting something? I've heard, I heard a rumor that you booked something and it, you know, the community is really small. And I was yeah. like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then three months later they announced, uh, Misty Knight and that I was a part of the show and there was nothing but positive responses to that, which is something that is overwhelmingly uncharacteristic about our industry. You know, a lot of times when people are announced to be a part of, a part of projects, people are like, oh, I hate that actor or oh, they should have picked this person or, you know, and thankfully all of the Marvel fans were just so like encouraging and they had been waiting 40 mm. plus years to see this woman come to life. And so they were, you know, excited that, that there was a new face that was doing it. And um, that has been, you know, that part of the marvel of it all and the fandom of it all that has just absolutely been something I will never, ever forget or take for granted, you know walking on the train and people are like, can I take a picture with you? Mm. And I have people send me art and people reach out mm. and say how much I've influenced them or their children. There was another actress uh, who my husband got a chance to work with who said, seeing your wife on TV with her natural hair made me wear my hair natural. Mm. And this is the first job that I've booked mm. with my hair like that. And she has never not worn her natural hair. And it's something as simple as your hair that then influences people to, right. to feel changed in some way. And so this role has been just like the biggest, biggest gift for me. It's been my largest role ever and you know, greatest accomplishment as an actor, but it definitely gave me much more than I could have ever asked for. Um, Cheo, the showrunner and main writer, he and I, I love him to this day, but he would say like, I'm the other writer because I was constantly like, okay, this doesn't make sense because this happened the last episode. And I already said this here. And mm -hmm. don't you remember this character said that? Like I was the same way that I would read a script a hundred times to prepare for a role. I was reading our scripts so much that I was mm -hmm. giving him insight about other characters. And you weren't afraid to do that. You, you weren't um, saying this is beyond my place. No, and it was because the 
um, the environment was such that it was welcoming. I mean, again, having my husband be in the industry for over 20 years, he definitely gave me the idea to have the permission to do that, to approach it as a collaborative um, environment. But every writer team is not collaborative um, for different reasons. Sometimes it's for ego. Sometimes it's lack of manpower. Sometimes it's there are too many people who have to approve this change. And that happened a lot with Marvel and with Netflix. You know, you've got two huge companies and entities with teams of people who say, these are the words that we allow. And every time I'm coming in and I'm like, I wouldn't say that. Mm. She wouldn't say it like that. Mm. This wouldn't happen like this. By the grace of God, mm. they listened to me wow. and they were accepting and I didn't win every fight. Yeah. I mean, there were things, Obviously, that, like you said, or like I said, with the superhero genre that you um, you accept. And so, you know, this brilliant detective who's got a sixth sense, she can look at a crime scene and see the whole world and figure it out. We coined it Misty Vision on, on set and in the scripts. I think that's what they called it. And yet she can't tell this guy that she slept with. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't the guy that's right? Oh, yeah. Okay, guys. And, you know, you have to trust the big picture. You have to trust the audience will go with you uh, and that they will believe you and that they will follow the story and not, you know, uh, have the same, that, that they won't balk at the same things that you do when you're reading mm -hmm. it as the actor. Uh, and, yeah, there, there are times when, you know, you miss the mark and, and, you suspend reality. I think that the superhero genre is definitely utilizing that suspension of disbelief right. at full throttle. Yeah. But it's something that people go into wanting to fall into that. They want to forget. They want to pretend that somebody can get shot in the arm, be near death bleeding out. Yeah. Somebody can sew them up with some floss and a little bit of liquor. And then the next episode, they're back at it. No pain, no nothing. You know, for me as the actor, I'm like, I think that I should still, you know. And they're like, uh-uh, for the shot, you're a hero. You need to come out looking like a hero. And so that was the, the one thing that, you know, your actor common sense is like, this doesn't work. But you watch the series as a whole or you watch the shows and you go, eh. I'm good with it. And so that's the marvel of it all. But for the most part, the scripts were amazing because they were so well thought out and they weren't just, you know, a blanket superhero story. I think that's what was great about Luke Cage, that it became a cultural phenomenon because it took that genre and said, but we can still tell the particulars about African-American culture in Harlem through this story. And so I think that's why it resonated with people so much. I think it's why uh, shows like Black Lightning can mm -hmm. exist now. And it's why people were so excited for Black Panther mm -hmm. and why it did so well globally because they had just seen Luke Cage, you know, a year prior. And so it was a wonderful experience. Let's talk about Chin. Explain this movie to people and then explain your involvement in it and your interest in it and how you got involved. So Jen is uh, the first feature film by Nigel Mamen, who is a black female director out of the Bay Area. She is also a Muslim and she wrote this story uh, almost like a love letter to Islam. Um, it's a film about a young girl named Summer whose mother converts to Islam her senior year of high school and what that does for her and for their relationship and for how she views herself. Um, it's very much Summer's story, but it's also Jade's story, which is her mother. And I play Jade Jennings, a woman who has spent her entire life searching for who she is. Uh, she's constantly reinventing herself and discovering different 
things that she falls in and out of, whether it be relationships or uh, political beliefs and social circles. And in this moment in her life, she has just discovered Islam. Uh, she's also a meteorologist. And so she's an on-camera person in Los Angeles, which if anybody has ever looked at the news in LA, it's literally like the club <laughs> at, on Hollywood and Highland, the way that the women dress and do their hair and their makeup and uh, the men too. And so for her, part of this journey is also figuring out how she can embrace this new religion and still maintain her job uh, in a political and social climate like the one that we are very much in that is wrought with Islamophobia and just horrible stereotypes and misconceptions about this religion. Um, I originally found out about the project through my husband. Uh, Dorian Misick is also in this film uh, and he was signed on to play the husband, David, or the ex-husband and father of Summer. And he had read the script and he was like, you know, I really think that you should take a look at this. Like, I think that you would be great for this. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I don't know what it's about, what's it about? And so um, he put me in contact with Nigela. I got a chance to read the script. She and I talked about it. And she, you know, thought that I would be a great fit to play Jade. And we ad nauseum talked about the script. And again, I was reading it over and over and over again. and you know, sharing with her some thoughts that I had about different ideas or different, you know, story plot points. And the film um, was just something that I felt was so important to share. I'm not a Muslim, but I see what is happening in the media. And this was, uh, this was before the ban, um, but during, I think we were filming during this time and you just knew how important this film was because I'm watching my country and the world being torn apart by rhetoric that is all to promote the financial gain of men in power and it has nothing to do with God or with religion it really has to do with fueling wars and keeping people divided and you know I have friends who are Muslims I know some beautiful uh, people who are loving and giving the same as people who are Buddhists and Jews and Christians alike. And uh, so her desire to share this part of that culture and to also just show a young black girl figuring herself out was something that I really wanted to be a part of. So. I asked her if I could come on as a producer, which she agreed to. And so this is the first film that I have also executive produced mm -hmm. and acted in. And it's just been a, a real journey, you know, a learning experience for me. And uh, also just, I'm amazed at how far this film has gone and how large its reach has been. Uh, and it's really, a testament to Nigella and to Averill Speaks, her producing partner, and the passion that they have about this film. And it, you know, I can tell that the way that people are receiving it is something that needs to be seen. This girl, Zoe Renee, she's incredible. She's the scenes you guys have. She's phenomenal. She's so phenomenal. This is like a star in the making. It, yeah. I mean, it seemed like you guys were really in sync as yeah. actors it i think um i never approach anything from a place other than open arms uh sometimes it can bite you if you're dealing with actors who aren't giving or prepared mm -hmm. zoe is just a big heart like she is a young woman that comes in with no ego no pretense uh she has a famous father and you wouldn't know it. They live out in the country. Like she's one of those just special people. And the way that she approaches her work and the way that she approached Summer was just such a real and loving place. She and I had to quickly 
establish a relationship. You know, we didn't have time to like, let's hang out, let's go get a coffee, let's talk about where you think these women are coming from. It was like, hey, Simone, nice to meet you. Let's do this project together. Um, but I had gotten a chance to see her audition and I just fell in love with her as anyone who watches the film does. I mean, she is special. There's no, um, I don't know what the right word is, but you know, you can sometimes watch young actors playing at something mm -hmm. and she's very much living it and feeling it as the moments come. And I think that also is a testament to Nigel's directing. You know, she's a director who very much uh, has a strong point of vision and what she needs, but she, she gets out of the way and she lets it kind of unfold the way it should. And Zoe was just so, so wonderful to work with. I can see just amazing things for her career from here on, because mm -hmm. she's phenomenal. Is there something that you're good at as an actor that you're not getting enough opportunities to <laughs> do? When I first started acting, I remember my dad was like, when are you gonna do some comedy? I was like, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, you're funny, man. You're not doing enough comedy. And I, had re I realized that everything that I had done on my own, every piece that I had done up until that point was all drama and comedy was what I, why I got into acting in the first place. That was my first love. And so um, comedy is definitely something that I don't think people expect when they see me or, or watch my work. They don't think that that's, you know, a strong suit of mine, but that is definitely what I want my next big opportunity to be is something in that vein because it's, it's like my first love. Um, so yeah, comedy. I want you to come back <laughs> when you've done a comedy and talk to me. Absolutely. Will you do that? Absolutely. Simone Missick, thank you. Thank you. So much for this. Appreciate this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is great. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. It's produced by Spencer Rain. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.